Hi, my name is Aiden, and I'm going to teach you how to match a free-to-play Ultimate Iron Man account. Some quick information about myself. My RSN is UIM Aiden. I'm the rank 17 free-to-play Ultimate Iron Man, and my account is base 85s and is 1400 total level. For the record, this video is a guide to matching, but is not just an efficient matching route. This is because free-to-play Ultimate Iron Man are limited in how efficiently they can train certain skills based on wilderness risk and server limits. This guide will also include multiple slower but easier stealing options for each skill as well. So why would you want to play a free-to-play Ultimate Iron Man? It's a fun and nostalgic game mode. It is immune from most pay-to-play focused updates. There are no daily tasks. And perhaps most importantly, it is free. So let's get into how to match this type of account. As of the recording of this guide, matching your free-to-play Iron Man takes just under 6,000 EHP. EHP here means efficient hours played. It's a metric the stealing community uses to assess how long certain grinds to take on the way to matching or 200 mil in all skills. There are six phases your account will go through on the way to matching. Questing and early stealing setup, Unlocking best in slot stealing equipment through range training. Melee training to maximize prayer or runecrafting XP. Melee training to finish off smithing and crafting. Finishing the gathering skills like fishing, cooking, and woodcut fire mage. And finally, finishing the runecraft and prayer wall. I won't focus too much on questing, since the only goal here is to finish Dragon Slayer. Completion of Dragon Slayer unlocks the ability to wear the Rune Plate body and Green Dehyde body. It also unlocks the resource area of the Corsair Cove. More on that later. If you are a brand new account, there are multiple guides for Tutorial Island to Dragon Slayer completion, which can easily be found online. I will, however, link a video of the current Dragon Slayer speedrun record for free to play Ultimate Iron Man accounts, if you are looking to be efficient right out of the gate. This video is by Ivanabi. The UIM DS10 account, as it is named, has not been touched since then, so you can look up the final stats of that account for reference. In addition to completing Dragon Slayer, it is also recommended to at least complete Imp Catcher to obtain the Amulet of Accuracy, as this will be your best in slot amulet until efficient melee training. My advice is to kill Imps at the Karamja Volcano for each bead, though you can also kill Imps quickly at the Southern Gate of Falador. And finally, in opposition to some older guides you may have seen already, you should complete Rune Mysteries for access to the Essence Mine and the ability to Lamp Runecrafting. Only hold off on completing Rune Mysteries if you are making a level 3 free-to-play Ultimate Iron Man, which this guide is not intended for. Let's quickly go over the free-to-play skills to get you up to speed. There are currently 15 skills available to free-to-play players, as shown here. Many of these skills will be trained at least partially, if not fully, through multi-stealing, where two or more skills are trained concurrently. For example, Prayer will accompany most, if not all, of your combat training through bone burying. Crafting will also accompany combat training through cutting uncut gem drops. Smithing will be trained alongside magic and mining through superheating iron ore. Crafting will mostly be trained alongside smithing, magic, and mining through silver tiara crafting. Fire mating will be trained by chopping and burning your own logs. Cooking will be trained by fishing and cooking your own fish. And finally, woodcutting and mining will accompany efficient rune crafting. We'll get into each of these methods with more detail later in this guide. But to note quickly, HP, magic, mining, and woodcutting are considered zero time skills here. This is because you shouldn't need to spend much, if any time, training them on their own. As a result, these four skills do not give EHP. Getting into early game stealing, there are several smaller goal levels you should aim to achieve before jumping into longer term stealing. These prerequisite skill levels will give you a glimpse into free-to-play stealing and allow you to maximize your XP gains later. While none of these are necessarily required, I recommend completing these grinds early on in your account's progression. Training Magic to 55 will unlock High Alchemy, the highest requirement useful spell for free-to-play. Along the way, you will unlock all other beneficial spells, such as teleports and other utilities like Superheat. 
This can be done quickly and cheaply by splashing Curse on the monk below the Varad Castle stairwell. This is the only time you will train magic on its own, as all magic training after this will be done zero time with other skills. For easy GP at this stage of the game, I recommend picking up steel items like plate bodies or plate legs in the wilderness and selling them to shops in Varrock. Training crafting to 43 unlocks the ability to cut diamonds. Since a considerable amount of crafting will be done zero time through uncut gems, this is a good one to get out of the way early. I suggest first killing cows in Lumbridge, tanning their hide in al -Karid, and crafting leather items to 16 crafting. From here, you can mine silver and craft silver symbols to 23 crafting, then tiaras to 43 crafting. I recommend doing this in al to begin with. We will cover efficient crafting later in this guide. To quickly note, by completing the Knight's Sword quest, you should not have to worry about training smithing to smelt silver before this. Training cooking to 55 unlocks the best food in free-to-play, the anchovy pizza. This is the best food item for eventual wilderness activity. You can start by net fishing and cooking shrimp and anchovies at any available net fishing location in free-to-play. I personally recommend net fishing with an axe at World 301 Draenor Village and completing forestry events for some early woodcutting at speed. At 20 fishing and cooking, you can switch over to fly fishing trout and later salmon at 30 fishing. I recommend the Barbarian Village fishing spot for this since there is a permanent cooking fire nearby. We'll return to efficient fishing and cooking training later in this guide. Training woodcutting and fire making to 30 will unlock willow trees, eventually being the fastest way to train woodcutting and fire making in free to play. Start by chopping and burning normal logs until oak trees, then chop and burn oaks at 15 until willows are unlocked. 41 woodcutting is recommended to eventually use the rune axe, but is not required. You can purchase iron and steel axes from Bob's axes in Lumbridge but mithril, adamant, and rune axes must be smithed at their respective smithing levels. We'll return to efficient woodcutting and fire making later in this guide once those axes are unlocked. Base 40 melees are a good starting point within combats for equipping rune weapons and armor. Base 60 melees can also be trained this early if looking to enter the wilderness with more protection, but more on that later. Buy and equip the best scimitar you can buy from Zeke's superior scimitars and al until mithril. At 30 attack, you can switch to the Adamant Sword, purchased at the Varrock Sword Shop. At 40 attack, you can switch to the Rune Sword from Stavo's Rune Store within the Champion's Guild. Optionally, you can complete the Below Ice Mountain quest and eventually create the Baronite Mace. This is just slightly better than the Rune Sword. The best melee item in free to play is the Rune Scimitar. We will save that for efficient melee training later in this guide after you've completed 89 smithing to make it. Iron Man armor is good enough to start with, but you can make upgrades to armor as desired from in-game shops. I recommend killing chickens to base 10, cows to base 20, and then minotaurs to base 40 or 60. If killing minotaurs, bury all bones, cut all gems, and pick up all GP, iron arrows, skull halves, and noted essence. You can use those noted essence to craft air runes to 9 rune crafting. Then you can use the Stull Scepter pieces to train body rune crafting, but more on that later. Picking up all iron arrows will help you jump into range training after this. Additionally, you can kill hill giants or mine golems at these lower melee levels starting at base 30. I won't go into too much detail regarding their drops until later, but personally I recommend minotaurs at this stage. 50 range should be completed after base 40 melees, since you will start with decent defensive stats. Having good started defense lets you skip out on slower safe spotting methods and needing as much food. Craft yourself some leather armor and buy the best short bow until maple. If you haven't already, finish Amputature for the Amulet of Accuracy. A quick reminder that if you already dropped the Amulet of Accuracy, you can reobtain the beads and return them to the quest NPC for an additional accuracy amulet. All of free-to-play range training should be done on rapid fire mode. Similar to melees, we'll train 1 to 10 at chickens, 10 to 20 at cows, then 20 to 50 at minotaurs. If you killed minotaurs for melees before this, you should have enough iron arrows to avoid purchasing more at shops. Luckily, minotaurs drop more iron arrows than you'll use to kill them at these levels. 
you will build up a nice surplus by 40 melees and 50 range of iron arrows. As a reminder, you should speak to the range tutor in Lumbridge before this to have arrows automatically go to your quiver as you pick them up. Now that you have decent starting stats, you are ready to get into the next phase of matching your account, unlocking best in slot stealing items. There are two smithing only items that we are looking to achieve here. 85 smithing for the rune axe and 89 smithing for the rune scimitar. The rune axe will allow you to train fire making and rune crafting efficiently through fast log collection and canoe chopping. More on those later. The rune scimitar is the best in slot melee item for all of free to play, as well as a prestige item amongst the free to play Iron Man community. The reason you only need to train smithing to the level before each item is unlocked is because free to players can purchase a dwarven stout for a plus one smithing boost. The current free-to-play meta for training smithing is by using nature runes to cast superheat on iron ore and then smithing those iron bars into plate bodies. Unfortunately, free-to-play iron men can only obtain nature runes through training combats and killing monsters which drop these runes. Since we want to save all of our melee XP until after the 89 smithing grind, and since magic is a zero time skill as established earlier, you will be training ranged instead. In order to obtain all the stealing resources for 89 smithing without overtraining ranged or dipping into your melee XP, you will focus on Odrises found in the Corsair Cove. Odris warriors and Odris shamans drop large amounts of law runes and nature runes, as well as GP and alchemical rune items. There are several safe spots located throughout both dungeons on Corsair Cove, but I recommend those found in the Corsair Cove resource area. This is because the other dungeon is often crowded with more bots and other players looking to access the bank. Training 50 to 99 range at Odrises will net you about 27,000 nature runes after using some to high out the rune item drops for GP. If we assume you'll be using all of those nature runes to efficiently superheat iron later on, that will only get you about 1 million smithing XP, barely a fifth of the 4.8 million smithing XP required for 89. This means we'll also be using all of our 27,000 law rune drops to train smithing as well, through either telegrabbing nature runes in the wilderness, or through silver crafting. Without getting too down in the weeds with law rune math, the efficient split of your law rune drops will be to use 26,300 law runes to telegrab nature runes in the wilderness, then 1,200 law runes to train silver tr crafting. We will train some crafting, because even if we telegrabbed with all of our law runes, we still would not receive enough smithing XP for 89 smithing. As an item of note, silver mining success does scale with mining level, which means that we'll save the silver crafting until after the iron smithing to give us a better mining level. Because telegrabbing nature runes in the wilderness comes with an inherent risk of getting PK'd, it is not smart to camp 99 range and telegrab afterwards with all your law runes. While some have gotten away with telegrabbing in this way, Others have perished and lost many hours of ranging progress. Since Ultimate Iron Men do not have access to a bank, there is no way to split our law rune stack. This means that the best way to minimize risk is to regularly take a break from ranging to go up to the wilderness and telegrab, then use those nature runes before returning to Odrises. This results in a three-part cycle. Killing Odrises, using law runes to get nature runes, then using nature runes for smithing XP. This cycle is a fundamental part of training smithing efficiently on a free-to-play Ultimate Iron Man, and will continue with all of your combat training. So with that out of the way, let's get into the actual efficient stealing methods, starting with ranging odrises. For armor, start by equipping a green dragonhide body, green dehyde chaps, green dehyde van braces, a coif, and an amulet of accuracy. There are no boots or cape slots which give ranged offensive bonus in free-to-play, but leather boots and normal capes will give you some defensive bonus. You can obtain the green dehyde body from a Zayat after completing Dragon Slayer, and you can obtain the green dehyde chaps, van braces, and the coif from Stavos Rune Store in the Champions Guild. For offense, equip a maple short bow and the iron arrows you should have collected from killing minotaurs previously. If you do not kill minotaurs, Use any GP you currently have to buy at least 1,000 iron arrows. The bow and arrows can be purchased from the range stores in Varrock or Remington. 
While you'll start with iron arrows at first, you will quickly obtain the GP to buy adamant arrows for future use. Keep in mind that you should be doing as much ranging as possible with adamant arrows as soon as you have the GP to purchase them. In your inventory, bring a chisel, some starter fire runes, and maybe some food. The chisel will be used to cut any uncut gem drops, and the fire runes will be needed to high out your first rune drops. If you do not have 43 crafting yet, cut whichever gems you can until the unlocking 43 crafting. If you do not have high alchemy unlocked, cast low alchemy on rune items or sell the items to general stores. GP is important to the stage because you'll need a few million GP to afford the adamant arrows to last you until 99 ranged. Safe spotting means you won't need to bring food, but at low HP it will be nice to have some while setting up your safe spot and de -aggroing. Ranging Odrises is itself a fairly simple method. Shoot your first arrow to lure the Odris over to the safe spot location, then continue firing arrows until finishing them off. To maximize your range XP per hour, Prey flick the best range boosting prey you have unlocked until Eagle Eye. Keep in mind, Odra Shamans have slightly lower range defense than the Warriors, so it is faster to kill them. To save spot the Shamans, just be sure to stay at least 5 tiles away to not get hit by their magic attacks. Personally, I find the Shamans to be pretty annoying, so I mostly stick to the Warriors. Something you want to strive for here is to maintain the 3 tick cycle of firing on rapid fire. This means you should learn to eventually loot the drops, bury the big bones, cut the gems, and high out drops without interrupting your arrow firing. This will take some time to learn, but it is necessary for getting the fastest possible range at speed here. As for drops, loot all law runes, nature runes, big bones, GP, uncut gems, rune med helms, rune battle axes, and rune full helms. You will also need to pick up fire runes and air runes as necessary for sustaining any high alchemy or teleport spells you cast to restock arrows. At low levels with lower GP stats, you should be high alchemy the med helms, battle axes, and full helms. At higher levels with a higher GP stack, you can start alchemy less. Personally, I stopped alchemy the med helms around 80 range. I recommend still picking up GP and alchemy even after you get all the adamant runes you need for 99 range because you'll eventually need about 25 million GP for rune crafting. More on that later. Additionally, you are free to pick up any other stackable item drops since inventory space isn't necessary here. I personally like to stack the death runes, chaos runes, cosmic runes, and mythal arrows to sell later to shops for additional GP. As mentioned previously, camping Odrises straight to 99 ranged isn't the smartest move since you'll need the telegrab in the wilderness to efficiently train smithing. At low levels, I recommend telegrabbing every time you stack 500 to 1000 law runes. At higher levels, you can get up to around 3500 law runes before running into world hop limitations. Now let's take a look at the telegrabbing nature rune method. If you are not aware, there is an island surrounded by lava in the northeast corner of the wilderness. This island contains seven nature runes split between two item piles. Using the Telekinetic Grab spell, otherwise known as Telegrab, you can pick these nature runes up for use in smithing later. This is considered the fastest way to get nature runes in free-to-play, and allows players to superheat iron ore efficiently later. By telegrabbing both piles and world hopping, you can receive just over 1500 nature runes per hour. For gear, bring in a Staff of Air and your Law Rune stack to cast the Telegrab spell. I also recommend bringing some fire runes for a quick Varrock teleport once you make it down to level 20 wilderness. As for other gear, your green dehyde armor acts as both best in slot ranged offense as well as best in slot ranged defense, meaning it's the best defensive gear for PK. Since the air staff only takes up your weapon slot, you have the shield slot open, so be sure to bring an anti fire shield for additional magic defense. An amulet of defense is optional, but will provide better defense than the amulet of accuracy. A stamina potion is optional if you want to have the run energy to get you all the way down to the ditch. And a rune plate body switch is also optional if you want a melee item in the event you get snared and hit with a rune scimitar. The rest of your inventory should be filled with food. Anchovy pizzas are currently the best food available in free-to-play to free-to-play Iron Man. Not only do they give the most HP per inventory slot, 
but pizzas allow for a mechanic called one tick eating, where you can eat a pizza half every one tick. This is important if a team does attack you, and you need to heal very quickly while running. Note that the one tick eating method only works if you click individual pizzas one at a time. It will not work if you try to eat the first and then second half of the same pizza. As for other food options, swordfish and kebabs are decent, but not nearly as good as anchovy pizzas. I recommend sticking with pizzas until you have a much higher defense and HP level, or if you are already familiar with PvP tanking. I will link a guide below with how I make an inventory of anchovy pizzas before each telegramming trip. To speed these rates up, we'll be utilizing a game mechanic known as double hopping. Each time you world hop, you are forced to wait a few seconds before the game completes your hop into the next world. This time is hardly remarkable on its own, but over hundreds of hours that waiting time adds up. To circumvent this waiting time, you can utilize two separate runescape clients to make your world hops almost instant. I won't get too down in the weeds, but this method works because whenever you log into the game, the client will go through a checklist. Since one of the last items of this checklist is checking if you are already logged in, you can start the login on one client before you log out on the other. This time is generally about 5 seconds, but can vary for a variety of reasons like server location and quality. The hopping method shown in this clip is called manual double hop, since you need to manually activate the logout and login on each client. This clip comes from Tanner Dino, the free-to-play Iron Man who first discovered and utilized this double hopping game mechanic. Take note of when he will begin the login sequence on the inactive client while still telegrabbing on the active client. By incorporating this double hopping, players can expect to receive up to 2,500 nature runes per hour. Since it is not obvious from this clip, the way he is changing worlds is through the Runelight World Hopper plugin. This plugin allows you to choose which world to log into without opening the world list from the login menu. While the plugin is not mandatory for this method, it is extremely helpful and highly recommended. If you are looking for more information on double hopping this way, I recommend checking out Tanadino's YouTube channel, which is linked below. The other double hopping method, and the one I currently use, is called continuous double hop. Remember how I said the login time is about 5 seconds long? Well, if you can keep your time in game to about 5 seconds or less, you can use the world hop without manually logging in and out. Since a single telegraph spell can be done in this time, you can continuously double hop the 4 rune spawn. This gives a similar amount of nature runes per hour compared to manual double hopping, but I find this method to be much more beginner friendly. Something to note with both double hopping methods is that you will hit the world hop limit faster than you normally would single hopping. To account for the world hop limit, we utilize all of the world hops available to us. Many people know that world hop limit exists, but did you know that different client types have different hop limits? First of all, different game clients will be built with either C++ or Java. The vanilla client and the normal runelike client use Java, while the Steam client and Jagex launcher clients use C++. Since these C++ and Java clients have different hop limits, you can hop with one of each client to maximize the amount of hops you can use. This, however, is not possible with the Jagex accounts, since Jagex accounts are forced to only use the Jagex launcher clients. For this reason, I recommend staying away from Jagex accounts for now. But this is still a developing story which should change by the time you watch this. Now let's get into escape scenarios. Obviously, if you are able to log out before the PK is able to attack you, then you'll be safe. If this happens, I just recommend hopping to a different set of worlds and hoping for the best. If you are attacked, you'll want to run southeast to get into the single combat zone as quickly as possible. Even if it's just one person attacking you, you don't know if they're truly alone or they, if they have an entire clan they're calling to. I repeat, do not just run south. Get to singles first, and then run south. Luckily, PKers are generally losers, so they're mostly going to be hunting alone. However, sometimes you will encounter teams of two or more, whether it be their own alts or some of their friends. On the rarest occasions, you'll run into an entire PKer clan's free-to-play night. Since that's almost an unwinnable scenario, I won't focus on that too much. 
Most PKers in free-to-play will be using a combination of ranged gear to deal damage, plus runes to cast snare on you. Generally, I will pray protect from magic until I make it to singles to avoid getting snared, and then protect from missiles to protect myself from their arrows all the way down to either level 20 wilderness or the ditch. I will only ever use protect from melee if I do get snared and they switch to a rune scimitar to deal melee damage. Keep in mind that you may not have to make it all the way down to the ditch or to level 20 wilderness to teleport out. Many times you'll escape their combat bracket before this point, and once you do that you'll be safe. Since the amount of PKers online is directly tied to when more players are logged in, I recommend only telegraphing on weekday mornings aligned with US based time zones. If you line it up correctly, European and American players will both be at work while Oceanic players will be heading to bed, meaning that there will be a minimal amount of PKers on at that time. If you can avoid it, do not telegraph over the weekend at any time, especially if you are looking to avoid PKers entirely. So now that we've used up our law runes by telegrapping nature runes in the wilderness, let's look into training smithing efficiently. Within free-to-play, there are no shops which sell ores or bars, nor monsters that drop them in significant quantities. For this reason, the free-to-play Iron Man meta for smithing includes the entire process of gathering ore, smelting into bars, and smithing into items. This method is called superheat smithing, and it utilizes this spot in the dwarven mine below Falador. Begin by mining the two iron rocks here and casting the superheat item spell on each ore. Since iron does not require additional ores or coal to smelt, it is far more efficient to make iron than any other bar type. Once you have filled your inventory with iron bars, run southwest to the anvil and smith each bar into an item. Plate bodies are fastest since they use up to five iron bars, so prioritize those over any other smithable item. If you completed the Knight's Sword quest and trained Silvercrafting to 43 before this, you should already have the 33 smithing requirement to make plate bodies. If not, smith any 3 bar item that you can until plate bodies are unlocked and then only make plate bodies after that. Before getting into micro efficiencies to speed this method up, let's talk about gear and inventory. You will need a rune pickaxe, nature runes, fire runes, and a hammer to smith the plate bodies. Ideally, with the pickaxe equipped, you will have 25 open inventory spaces. This means a clean five plate bodies each trip to the anvil. If you are holding onto any other items, like a law rune stack, you will either need to drop an item stack to maintain the 25 inventory spaces, or accept slower smithing rates by making four plate bodies, and then however many two or three bar items you need to finish. Otherwise, because this method is run energy dependent, you should avoid wearing any gear which should slow you down. For those of you who are lazy, I promise you, it does not take that long to re-gear before heading back to Odrises, so feel free to sell back any of your green dragon hide gear. Getting into micro efficiencies, the first and easiest to learn is faster anvil smithing. When you click the anvil normally, there is a small delay before the anvil interface opens. To avoid this delay, you can instead use an iron bar from your inventory on the anvil instead of just clicking it on its own. Combining this with using spacebar to smith the last smithed item, it speeds up the smithing process by a few hundred XP. Second, and most importantly, we'll be looking at speeding up the ore collection process. Iron mining is a three tick action, meaning that once you click the iron rock, you will roll a chance of obtaining the ore in three game ticks. From 61 mining onwards, your chance of mining an iron ore is 100%, making it a reliable 3 tick time requirement. With tick manipulation, you can begin this 3 tick time requirement before the iron rock even spawns. If you time it right with a separate 3 tick action, such as grabbing snow from a snow pile, you can mine the iron on the first game tick it spawns in. Snow is the most reliable way to 3 tick mine iron so I recommend completing a Christmas holiday event as soon as possible to unlock snow. Once a Christmas event is completed, you can grab the reindeer antlers here from Diango and Draenor Village and begin snow mining. This clip by Automology shows the combined usage of faster anvil smithing, snow mining, and efficient item juggling. By using all of the micro efficiencies available to you, 
This method speeds up from about 25 TA smithing hits per an hour up to a max of over 30 TA an hour. I'll let this clip play for a bit so you can get a better idea of the method. The full clip can also be found on his AE Clips YouTube channel, which is linked below. Alternatively, the other way to 3 tick mine iron without the use of snow is to utilize auto retaliation on an attacking dwarf. Dwarves attack every 5 game ticks, so we can utilize the auto retaliation mechanic before each iron rock spawns. In this case, the superheat spell is used to prevent our character from attacking the dwarf on top of smelting the bar. Since this method also requires you to mine the first two rocks before tick manipulation begins, it is theoretically the same speed as snow mining. However, this method does require some babysitting of the dwarf to make sure he doesn't get stuck. Still, 30k smithing XP an hour is achievable here. Again, I'll let this method play for a moment to hopefully give you a better understanding of the timing with the dwarf. Keep in mind, at low defense, the dwarf can outdamage your healing ability. Armor may be utilized to counteract this. Before moving on, there are a few notes to add here. First, since this is a run-dependent method, you'll need to make sure that you efficiently use the run energy you have. Run drains depending on carrier weight, so try a run with an empty inventory and walk with a full inventory. Second, you can talk to Arthur the Clue Hunter in Lumbridge to remove the ability for clue geodes to spawn. Unfortunately, you're still stuck with the uncut gem rules, so you'll eventually learn to drop these while minimizing time loss. Finally, to clear up some confusion, let's talk about the EHP rates. While you can get over 30k smithing XP per hour with this method, you will notice the EHP rate on websites like Temple are much lower. This is because the efficient smithing rate also includes the time spent telegrapping the nature runes. At 61 mining and above, EHP assumes an effective rate of 24,000 smithing XP per hour. Since many new free-to-play Ultimate Ironmen may be too scared to give high-risk, high-reward wilderness strats a try, I will also include here the second fastest sustainable smithing method. This clip here by Tanner Dino is the ultimate Iron Man friendly ring of forging smithing method with disc of return teleports. Since the release of Crack the Clue 3, free to play players are able to access the Varrock West Bank Vault located in the bank's basement. In order to unlock this area, you will need to complete the last two steps of the Crack the Clue 3 event. This includes gathering a full inventory of miscellaneous items digging a spot just outside the water rune altar, and then inputting an emote code just outside the bank vault. I will link a video by Automology on his AE Clips YouTube channel outlining how free-to-play Ultimate Iron Man can unlock this method. Once you gain access to the bank vault for the first time, you will just need to input the same emote code to enter and exit it later. The reason why we do all of this is because there is a ruby ring spawn inside the bank vault, which we can easily turn into a ring of forging. By doing the disc to return ring of forging smithing method here, players can expect to get around 13k smithing XP per hour. Note, since this method does not require telegrabbing nor superheating, you would eventually have to train some magic on its own since smithing accounts for most of magic being zero time. Assuming you use the first 26.3 thousand law runes from Odrises, and all of the nature runes, on superheat smithing, you should now have around 4.5 million smithing XP. To finish off 89 smithing with the remaining 1200 or so law runes, we will train crafting with silver tiaras. For this method, you will need a rune pickaxe, chronicle, tiara mold, law runes, water runes, and air runes to cast the Faldo teleport spell. The Chronicle is a teleportation method available in free-to-play, which allows players to teleport just outside the Champion's Guild. It uses charges called teleport cards, which can be purchased from Diango in Draenor Village. While these teleport cards used to be limited to buying just 100 per day, that limit has been removed as of a recent update. The Chronicle can hold up to 1,000 of these charges. The tiara mold can be purchased from crafting stores in Alcarid or Remington. Equip the pickaxe and chronicle, 
Then start by Chronicle teleporting to the Champions Guild. Run west to the Verrock Southwest Mine and mine the three Silver Rocks. You will need to world hop eight times to gain a full inventory of Silver Ore. With a full inventory, teleport back to Falador and use the nearby Falador Furnace. Smelt the ore into bars, then craft the bars into tiaras. Chronicle teleport back to the Champions Guild, drop your tiaras as you approach the Silver Rocks, and repeat. Since this method uses run energy, don't forget to take advantage of minigame teleports to Ferrot's Enclave every 20 minutes. At Ferrot's, you can quickly step into the Clan Wars free-for-all portal located just south of the bank chest. By teleporting out from here, you will have all of your stats restored, including full run energy. As with other resource-dependent methods in this game, you will never be the only player mining silver. Since so much of your time is spent at the furnace, players will see the silver rocks you mined and assume the worlds are open. Don't take it personally. Just try to find a different set of worlds to mine in. While the best single hop rates are just above 18k crafting XP per hour, expect a more reliable 17k XP an hour with the amount of crashers you'll face. To increase these rates, let's start with leather mining. As mentioned previously, silver mining success scales with mining level. Assuming you superheated before this, you'll have around 87 mining, which will give you an approximate success chance of 70%. At 99 mining, this matches out at only 78%. By using leather, you can more effectively and reliably mine the silver rocks with double rolls. For this, you will need a piece of leather, a needle, and thread. While at least one tile away from the silver rock, use the needle on the leather and hold down space to begin crafting an item. One tick later, click the desired silver rock and wait to mine it. This will not work 100% of the time, as double roll only gives around a 96% chance of mining at the absolute highest, so you may need to wait until the ore is obtained. You can leather mine the rock you spawn right next to, but the benefit of leather mining will barely outweigh the benefit of just quickly clicking the rock. Finally, since this method utilizes world hopping, we can introduce double hopping to speed things up further. By combining leather mining and double hopping, which is shown previously, it is possible to achieve up to 20k crafting XP per hour. This clip by Tanadino, which has been playing, shows both of these micro efficiencies in action. Pay attention to when he uses the leather while mining, as well as when he begins logging in on the second client. As a general rule for double hopping, keep in mind that failed logins count towards the hop limit. This means that if you fail a login, or if you try logging in and then realize you already have a full inventory of silver and let the other client go to a failed login, those failed hops will contribute towards your total number of world hops. Luckily for this method, you won't reach the hop limit for a solid 9 to 10 hours. However, it's a good to start learning double hop best practices early. So try to keep an eye on your inventory to avoid unnecessary hop attempts at the end of each inventory gathering. If you want a better idea of how full your inventory is as you mine, I recommend using RuneLight's Inventory Viewer plugin. Since you will gain 0.261 smithing XP per crafting XP with this method, those 1200 law runes will give not only 1.5 million crafting XP, but also the remaining 400,000 smithing XP for 89 smithing. If you cut all your gems from Odrises before this, you will end up with around level 80 crafting. Combining all of your mining and magic together as well should net you around 89 mining and at least 92 magic at this point. Since the constant crashing at Verox Southwest Silver can make this grind unpleasant to many people, the second option for crafting can be done at the Crafting Guild instead. This method is very similar to Verox Southwest, but instead of Chronicle teleporting, you will be running from the Falador Furnace south to the Crafting Guild. The only additional requirement for this is a brown apron, which can be purchased in Barak. The crafting guild requires 40 crafting to enter, but you should have that crafting level before starting this grind. Crafting guild will generally top out at around 14.5k crafting XP per hour, which is slower but much more relaxed than Verat Southwest. The final option for crafting is wilderness gold amulets. For this method, I recommend only bringing some type of slash weapon, like a cheap sword, to slash the spider's web, and an amulet mold. Head north from Ferrat's Enclave to the wilderness ruins just west of the Boneyard. Run to the furnace, 
Then run to the Goldor spawn to set up your de-aggro area, and wait until the spiders stop attacking you. Then, pick up a full inventory of gold ore by world hopping. Run to the furnace, smelt the gold ore into bars, then craft gold amulets. Then drop the amulets on your way back to the gold ore spawn and repeat. This method is really only worth it if you double hop, and gives less crafting XP at only 10k XP an hour, but gives greater smithing XP at 7.5k an hour than crafting silver tiaras. This method is very hop intensive, so you will run out of hops in just about 2 hours of doing this. At this point, you are done with your ranging grind. Congrats. While many players will go right to 90 unranged, I do recommend stopping at around 12.5 million range SP. This is because the efficient melee training route can include bossing, which is fastest to do with ranged. We'll cover that topic later in this guide. But for now, it's worth knowing if your goal is to max with as little post XP as possible. If you do stop ranging before 99, just remember to tweak your smithing and crafting numbers to make up for this. For example, stopping range at 12.5 mil range XP will mean less law runes for superheating, and will therefore require more law runes to be used for crafting to ensure you get 89 smithing by the end of this grind. So now that you've completed the first big phase of your matching journey, let's review. With 85 and 89 smithing achieved, you have unlocked the two best items in free-to-play. At 85 smithing, you unlock the Rune Axe. This is the best axe in free-to-play, unlocking efficient tree chopping and canoe making. Essentially, from any point after this, you are free to train efficient fire making and rune crafting at any points. Before we get into melees, let's talk a bit more about woodcutting and fire making, and why you should get those levels up early. For free-to-play Ironmen, there aren't many worthwhile AFK methods available to us. However, AFKing yew trees and burning yew logs is one of the better AFK methods that we have. This means that if you are looking to unlock decent AFK early on, I recommend training woodcutting and fire making to at least 60 once you unlock the rune axe. On top of the 60 woodcutting requirement for yew trees, you can train an additional woodcutting level to 61 to unlock efficient canoe mating. Making canoes is one of the best ways free to players have for getting around the game. In combination with the Chronicle Teleport, it gives us easy access to places like the Wilderness, Ferrat's Enclave, Edgeville Dungeon, Barbarian Village, and Lumbridge. Since making a canoe is tied to your woodcutting level on Axe tier, you will need 61 woodcutting to unlock efficient canoes with a rune axe. Alternatively, you need at least 78 woodcutting to unlock efficient canoes with an adamant axe. More on that later. Unfortunately, with mithril axes and below, you will never achieve a high enough woodcutting level to make canoes with a 100% success rate. For now, let's take a look at how you will be training woodcutting and fire making. Since woodcutting is a zero time skill, you will primarily train the skill alongside fire making. The rest of your woodcutting XP will come from making canoes for rune crafting, but more on that later. For all of woodcutting starting at level 30, willow trees will be the fastest way to train the woodcutting and fire making skills together. Luckily, there are hundreds of willow trees spread out throughout the game to try out, so pick whichever one you like. There are only two items you need to train fire making your axe and a tinderbox. Once you have chopped a full inventory of logs, use your tinderbox on any log and begin fire making. Within RuneScape, every time you light a log, your character will automatically walk to the west. However, there is enough of a time gap between each log that you can walk or run a few tiles in any direction. Your first goal with approaching efficient fire making should be the path your fires in such a way where you return your character to the trees you were originally chopping by the time you finish up your inventory. This minimizes time loss. Next, we'll look at speeding up log collection through the actual woodcutting action. First, make sure neither you nor anybody else chopping the tree has a forestry kit. Since the release of forestry, having a forestry kit equipped or even in your inventory will roll the chance of spawning a forestry event. In free to play, we have the chance to spawn three of these events, including the sapling, rising roots, and ents. Since none of these events give logs, they will only slow down your fire making XP. 
This means it is not efficient to engage with forestry while training this skill. Willow tree chopping is a four tick action, meaning you will roll a chance at receiving logs every four game ticks. Assuming you start off with 40 wood cutting, your chance of receiving a log is only around 40% per log roll. By the time you reach 99 wood cutting, that chance will only increase to around 70% chance. This means you will only receive 40 to 70% of the logs you roll on the way to higher wood cutting and fire making levels. To account for this, we will increase our log gathering rates by giving ourselves more rolls with tick manipulation. You can speed things up to roll in your willow log every three game ticks by using a three tick item like snow. Snow woodcutting is the easiest way to speed up woodcutting and it is just as simple as snow mining. Earlier in this guide, we talked about snow mining by spawning snow with reindeer antlers. While antlers are a decent way to spawn snow, the easier way to spawn snow is with a snow globe. Remember, you need to complete a Christmas holiday event to unlock these items, so complete one as soon as it is available in December. Snow globes are can be obtained as holiday items from Diego, so start off by grabbing one from him in Draenor Village. Spawn a snow pile, click the snow pile, then click the willow tree, then wait two tits for the roll, and then repeat. Each time your snow pile despawns, spawn another pile and continue until your inventory is full. To speed up snow woodcutting, let's first take a look at the mechanics of a snow pile. Each time you activate a snow globe or antlers, you must wait seven game tits for the snow to spawn onto the ground. That snow pile will then only last for 24 game tits before despawning, meaning that you can obtain a maximum of seven logs per snow pile. Since you can only spawn a single snow pile at a time, this forces a mandatory 7 tick waiting time between snow piles where you are forced to chop the tree normally at the standard 4 tick speed until more snow spawns. But this begs the question, why is it that you can only spawn a single snow pile? Well it turns out that you can in fact spawn multiple snow piles at a time, but you can only have one snow pile spawned per 8x8 game chunk. This means that if you can find two willow trees along one of these 8x8 chunk borders, you can spawn different snow piles within each chunk to maintain an active snow pile at all times. We call this method double snow woodcutting, or rather, consistent three tick woodcutting. An alternative way to consistently three tick woodcut is by taking advantage of auto retaliate. By getting into combat with a six tick attack speed NPC like a farmer, you can chop normally at the 4 tit speed, but use auto retaliate to gain an additional log roll every 6 ticks. Thinking in terms of the 6 tit combat style, you will essentially squeeze in two normal log 4 tit log rolls between 6 tit attacks. This averages to 8 log rolls per 24 game ticks, or 6 normal logs plus the two additional rolls from auto retaliating. 8 rolls per 24 ticks is effectively the same as one log per three ticks, making this a three tick wood cutting action. The timing can be a little hard to get at first, so I'll keep this clip by say F2P Alt playing to give you a better visual. I will also link this video on his YouTube channel below. Since you will need to ensure your character isn't wood cutting when you get hit, watch as he clits the ground right before getting attacked. This step is necessary to get in the auto retaliate roll every time. So how do we speed things up from here? Well, we can combine double snow and auto retaliate for the fastest woodcutting method in free to play, 2.6 hits tick willows. Luckily, there are a few areas in this game with willow trees on a chunk border, plus a nearby four tick attacking NPC. The one shown in this clip by Automology is the three willow spot just south of the Port Sarim jail. Start by tagging the correct rat located within the prison and luring it down to the willow tree spot. I recommend bringing some runes and grabbing your Iron Man armor to ensure you don't insta-kill the rat by splashing on it. You can then equip a short bow with no arrows to ensure that you never hit the rat on accident afterwards. Then you can start double snow woodcutting and taking advantage of the auto retaliation with the rat. This is one of the more technically difficult methods in all of free to play, so I recommend studying this clip and letting yourself get plenty of practice in to achieve success.
Now that we've introduced each of the ways you may find yourself collecting willow logs, let's talk about rates. At 99 woodcutting, the maximum fire making rate with 2.66 stitch willows is just under 70k fire making SP per hour. If you're using double snow or farmer 3 tick woodcutting, you will see a max of about 65k fire making SP per hour. If you're using a single snow pile, expect maximum rates of just under 60k fire making SP per hour. Since you receive 67.5 woodcutting SP per 90 fire making SP with willow logs, you will complete any fire making XP goals with 70% of the matching wood cutting XP. For example, if just going for 61 wood cutting, you will finish with close to 64 fire making. If rushing 99 fire making right away, you will end with just over 96 wood cutting. For the sake of matching with as little post XP as possible, I recommend holding off on finishing fire making until finishing fishing and cooking first. More on that later in this guide. Getting away from efficiency, let's finish this woodcutting segment with one of the better AFK options for free-to-play Ironmen, that being AFK U-Trees. Since the release of Forestry, you are able to chop U-Trees for 119 ticks, or just under 2 minutes, before they despawn. Due to the low success rate of receiving u logs, you likely will not fill your inventory within this time. This means that you have a consistent AFK time of about 2 minutes before having to click on another yew tree to finish chopping an inventory of yew logs. By burning the yew logs and then staying AFK while chopping, you can get around 40k fire making SP per hour at 99 wood cutting. This is a consistent 0.6 EHP per hour and it is very AFK, meaning that many Iron Men will find themselves spending their downtime here while still getting their gains in. Additionally, the jump from adamant to rune axe at use is much less pronounced than at willow trees, meaning that if you were to chop yew trees to 99 fire mating, you would save less than 5 hours with a rune axe compared to just using an adamant axe on lots at 70 smithing as opposed to 85. While there are several yew tree spots around the game, I personally recommend the four trees outside Melzar's maze in Remington, as they are usually very quiet with less trashes. With that out of the way, let's take a look at that shiny rune scimitar you've unlocked with 89 smithing. With melees, you now have a primary and secondary goal to look out for. Primarily, you will be using melees to gain the runes for efficiently training to 99 smithing through telegrabbing and 99 crafting through uncut gems and silver TRs. Secondary to smithing and crafting, you can either maximize prayer XP, rune crafting XP, pure combat XP, or AFK time. Within free-to-play, we are given a variety of options for which monsters to kill. Since the Rune Scimitar is the best in slot weapon against all of these monsters, you now have the ability to kill all of them efficiently. Remember earlier when I talked about killing Odrises for their overpowered Law and Nature Rune drops? The same thing applies to melees as there is no efficient route to maxing smithing and crafting without killing some odresses. Luckily, you have about 39 million melee XP to work with between attack, strength, and defense. And you would only need to spend about 20 million of that XP at odresses to bank your 99 smithing and crafting. The true goal then will be splitting up your 39 million required melee XP between two or more monsters in such a way so that you bank smithing and crafting while simultaneously chasing a third goal. As for third goals, let's start with the most popular one, maximizing prayer at speed. Since the efficient prayer training method is considered very technically challenging, many players will split their melees between hill giants and odorous warriors to maximize prey at speed. To understand how we will be splitting up melee splits between two monsters, we can use this monster ratio calculator located on the free-to-play wiki. Tanadino was responsible for putting this together, so be sure to thank him if you use this. Assuming you'll be starting melees with 89 smithing and 80 crafting, you will spend about 32.7 million melee XP at hill giants and the remaining 6.3 million melee XP at odorses. Matching your combats this way will net you not only 99 smithing and crafting, but also 3.6 million prayer XP and about 1900 obor kills. Note, since Odrises have very high defense, it is smartest to save Odrises until after the Hill Giants. 
Next, let's look at melees with maximizing runecrafting XP in mind. The current fastest runecrafting method available to free-to-play Ultimate Iron Man takes advantage of two items, the Skull Scepter and Noted Rune Essence. By killing Minotaurs, you will receive the teleport charges for the Scepter as well as lots of Noted Essence. Since Minotaurs don't drop Law Runes or Nature Runes, you will be forced to maximize time in Odrises to ensure 99 smithing and crafting before Matt's melees if taking this route. Again, assuming you'll be starting melees with 89 smithing and 80 crafting, you will send about 20.2 million XP at Minotaurs and the remaining 18.7 million XP at Odrises. On top of 99 smithing and crafting, this method will net you about 8.5 million runecrafting experience of the fastest runecrafting SP possible, which is over 1 to 1 EHP. More on this runecrafting method later. Keep in mind, if you are the most efficient type of player and will be playing this game tit perfectly, Minotaurs are technically the fastest route to match. If you aren't as concerned with prayer or runecrafting SP, and are just looking for the fastest melee XP rates possible, then look no further than Moss Giants. With higher HP and less clicking than Hill Giants, Moss Giants provide the highest possible melee XP rates for free-to-play Iron Men. Interestingly, your Moss Giant XP split will depend on whether you kill Moss Giants in the Wilderness or not. This is because killing Moss Giants in the Wilderness gives you a much higher drop rate for the Mossy Keys needed to access Bryophyta the Moss Giant boss. More on that later. If you kill Moss Giants outside of the Wilderness, and assuming 89 smithing and 80 crafting beforehand, you will spend about 28.3 million of your melee XP at Moss Giants and 10.6 million XP at Odorous Warriors. This results in decent zero-time prey XP at 2.2 million, as well as about 830 Bryophyta kills. If killing Wilderness Moss Giants, the split slightly changes to 31.9 million melee XP at Moss Giants and 7.1 million at Odrises. This results in about the same prayer XP of 2.2 million, but gives you closer to 2,000 Bryophyta kills. Finally, let's look at maximizing AFK. Besides yew trees, the most popular AFK method in all of free to play is killing flesh crawlers. Since Flesh Crawlers deal low damage and are aggressive at all combat levels, they make for decent AFK training. With the release of stackable Soul Scepter teleport charges, Flesh Crawlers are a somewhat viable way to train melees now in an Ultimate Ironman. Similar to Minotaurs, Flesh Crawlers do not give Law or Nature Rune drops, so you will have to maximize your time at Odrises. The split here is about 20.3 million available AFK melee XP at Flesh Crawlers, before the remaining 18.7 million XP needs to be spent at Odrises to ensure 99 smithing and crafting. Ultimately, your melee route doesn't need to stick to any singular one of these options. Personally, I have spent time at all five of these monsters and still haven't even matched one of my melee skills. I recommend giving each of these options a try as you may enjoy some monsters more than others. You may also enjoy some of the bossing and stealing options these different monsters make available. More on those later. While those are the five monsters I will focus on for this guide, here are some other monsters to consider. Body and Mind Golems in the Camdozel Ruins, good for gem drops and runecrafting XP. Dark Wizards south of Varrock, good for nature runes and beginner clues. Crafting Guild Cows, good for crafting XP through tanning and crafting leather items and Lumbridge Goblins, good for very quick and easy beginner clues. While none of these are considered efficient, they can be a fun way to shake up things on your journey to Matt's melees. As a general item of note, you may remember earlier in this guide when I mentioned not finishing 99 ranged. If you choose to spend time at Hill Giants or Moss Giants and their respective bosses, the most efficient way to kill those bosses is with ranged. This is why it is smart to keep that available ranged XP open as to minimize post XP gains if you are going those routes. With our melee overview out of the way, let's take a deeper dive into each of these monsters, starting with Hill Giants. There are currently four available Hill Giant locations within free-to-play, but the only two locations that offer decent kills per hour 
of the Edgeville Dungeon and the Giant's Plateau, east of Altrid. Personally, I prefer the Giant Plateau spot shown in this clip. Make sure to bring at least your Rune Scimitar and a Chisel to use on Uncut Gems. At lower levels, I recommend filling up your inventory with food and bringing the best Rune Armor available. Keep in mind that Kareem in Altrid sells kebabs for 1 GP and that the Rune Chain body is better against crush damage than the Rune Plate body. At higher defense levels, you can replace food with Strength Potions, made with Limpwort Roots from Hill Giants and Red Spider's Eggs found in the Varrock Sewers. You want to pick up Law Runes, Nature Runes, GP, Giant Keys, and Limp Words to get more Strength Potions later, on top of the Uncut Gems. As you level up your Attack and Strength levels, you will see your rates increase. Generally, at lower levels, you can get around 20k Strength, Attack, or Defense SP per hour, and that will climb up to around 50k at max. Your Prayer rates will start at around 1k an hour, but can climb up to close to 6k at max. With the basics out of the way though, Let's take a look at some efficiencies you can implement to speed things up here even more. Similar to ranging Odrises, the first step towards reaching efficiency here is ensuring that you attack every four game ticks. Since the Rune Scimitar is a four tick weapon, you want to make sure that you are attacking a giant as often as possible. This means you should learn to pick up drops, bury bones, cut gems, and move around while staying in combat at all times. Speaking of cutting gems, this action will be interrupted by an attacking giant, so don't cut them until just after you've been attacked to ensure that it goes through successfully. To fully utilize the giant's plateau location, let's talk about movement and small bone spawns. The reason many free-to-play Iron Men enjoy this spot is because of the many hill giants and the small bones scattered around on the ground. Since three of these bones are in convenient locations surrounded by giants, you can maximize your prayer XP by constantly moving to grab and bury these extra bones. Keep in mind, armor is generally heavy. This means you will deplete your run energy quickly by running all over the place. To maintain combat at all times while moving around to bury these bones, try to implement walking whenever possible to save run energy. Now let's get into prayer flicking. You will gain a significant amount of melee XP per hour by flitting prayers like Ultimate Strength and Incredible Reflexes, which give an additional 15% Strength and Attack bonus respectively. Additionally, you can also pray flit Protect from Melee to prevent the Giant's ability to damage you. The timing on this works well, since you will often share your own attacks and the Giant's attacks on the same tick. For this, I just recommend setting your Quick Prayers to all three of these. As for gear, if you find yourself running out of prayer points before running out of health, you can switch out some of your rune armor pieces for Munch Rope pieces, which give prey bonus. These can be found in the monastery east of Edgeville. If all that's not efficient enough for you, let's pull out one last card, the Event RPG Switch. At higher combat levels, you will start to deal too much damage to the hill giants due to their low hit points. This comes from the form of over damage, where essentially your max hit is much higher than the hill giant's remaining HP after a few hits. However, you can avoid this phenomenon by switching to a weapon that attacks at a faster speed even if it doesn't do as much damage as the scimitar. The event RPG is a meme item from Diango which came with the 2014 Goblin Invasion event. However, this weapon allows you to kick your punch at a 3 tick attack speed as opposed to the 4 tick scimitar. You are essentially hoping to get the hill giant down to a low enough HP to have your last hit be faster with the event RPG, rather than waiting to kill it with the scimitar. This will speed up the kill. I will link below a website which you can input your stats and gear to see at what strength boost and giant HP are needed to optimize an event RPG switch to gain the most benefit from this. Combining all of these efficiencies, we can look at this clip here by Tanadino to see just how fast hill giants can be killed. With prey flicking, strength potions, three bone burying, and good movement, melee rates can climb as high as 55k per hour. Prayer XP rates can climb as high as almost 7k per hour. These rates, of course, will scale with your attack and strength levels all the way up to 99. 
Now comes the age-old question. How should you separate training attack, strength, and defense? Luckily, Tanner already has you covered with a melee order calculator located on the free-to-play wiki. Since this calculator will only focus on attack and strength levels, it will be up to you to figure out when you want to level your defense. Generally, I like to train my attack and defense to roughly the same levels, so I did so up until around 85, but everybody's preference is different. If you want to rush to not needing food, train up to around 70 defense, then go for maxing attack and strength. If you plan to prey flick all of melees through melee protection, you can rush 90 in strength and attack right from 40 defense. Again, this will be up to you on when you want to train your defense. However, since you will afford the melee XP to get 99 strength and attack before going to Odrises, I recommend doing so, as you'll want those stats before you touch those. I won't include it here, but I will also link a guide to how I turn my Limport Roots into strength potions below. Feel free to give that a look. When it comes to killing hill giants, it is very much worthwhile to kill the hill giant boss Obor with all of your giant keys. Obor is where you will receive most of your law and nature runes during this grind, as well as lots of GP from alchemists. Obor's lair is located at the back of the Edgeville dungeon, past all of the hill giants. Each giant key grants you a one-time entry into Obor's lair, meaning you will use the key regardless of whether or not you are able to kill him. While there are a few ways to kill Obor, the two I'll focus on in this guide are face tanking and ranged safe spotting. For face tanking, I equip the best in slot melee defensive gear, including the rune chain body, the rune plate skirt, the rune full helm, my best available shield, and fancy boots. I also bring as much food as I can carry. At low levels, I recommend bringing better food, things like swordfish or pizzas but at higher levels, kebabs are fast and good enough food. I also bring a chronicle and an axe for easy teleporting to places like Ferrat's Enclave for stat restore and Alterid for the kebabs. I also bring a small stack of fire runes to high out any rune item drops. Finally, remember to bring the brass key for easier access into the Edgeville dungeon from the barbarian village to new spot. Pick up all big bones, law runes, nature runes, giant keys, and any rune drops you want to high out or sell. If returning to hill giants right afterwards, pick up the noted limpor roots to make making strength potions easier. The fight with Obor is pretty simple. As soon as you climb down into the pit, he will aggro immediately. Obor has three attack styles, melee, ranged, and magic. He will use these attacks depending on which prayer you are praying against. By tanking his melee hits, and praying protect from missiles, you will only receive the damage that comes through your melee armor and his magic attack. This minimizes how much damage you'll take throughout the fight. Don't forget to back yourself into a wall or corner to avoid being thrown around by some of his melee hits. Keep an eye on your prey points and HP throughout the fight, and eat when necessary. Even at a high defense, Obor will still deal a lot of damage to you. This means that you'll need to stat restore and get more food often. If you do die, just go back to the gate to Obor's lair and pick up your items to try again. The fastest, safest, and yet somewhat more difficult way to kill Obor is by safe spotting him with ranged. Since you can't attack Obor from the area near the gate, the only way you can safe spot him is trapping him in an approach state. Essentially, the only time Obor isn't attacking you is when he is approaching you to attack later. By attacking him when you run in, and then running to the southwest corner of the pit, you can get him stuck on some geometry to lock him into trying to approach you. Then, you can attack him several times with ranged without receiving any attacks. Unfortunately, he won't stay in this state forever, so after about 15 ticks, you will need to get him to approach you again. You can do this by stepping out and stepping back into the safe spot tile and letting him hit you once with a ranged attack. Now, if you mess up the initial approach, you just have to run to the east side of the room and then run back to the southwest corner to set this up again. This method was discovered by Tandardino and can net upwards of 50 kills per hour. Assuming you use this ranged method for all of your Obor kills, 
and only do hill giants and odrises to match melees. You will kill approximately 1900 obor, and that will net you about 900,000 range SP. Keep that number in mind when going for 99 range, and work it into any min-matching calculations you may make on your own account. Now that we've covered melees for maximizing prayer SP, let's look at melees to maximize runecrafting SP. Minotaurs are located in the first level of the Stronghold of Security, just below the Barbarian Village. There are two varieties, including level 12s and level 27s. For this method, we will just focus on the level 12s. Minotaurs are a very low level NPC, so you will be killing them very quickly. The rooms with level 12 minotaurs are also pretty big, so they'll easily spread out. As a result, you will find yourself moving all over the place to remain in combat while picking up drops. For this reason, I recommend going as light as possible on equipment and armor. You will at least need your rune scimitar, strength amulet, and a chisel for attacking and for cutting gems and skull halves. For armor, I recommend minimizing weight as much as possible. After the fancy boots, green dehyde van braces, and cape, I recommend only one or two rune armor pieces. Personally, at higher defense level, I just use the rune med helm, but feel free to experiment here at lower levels with things like the full helm or other armor pieces. For drops, pick up all skull halves, noted essence, uncut gems, and as many bones and GP piles as you can. Since you will be killing so many minotaurs, you will quickly find yourself surrounded by loot piles. Remember, we're focusing on runecrafting supplies here, so don't feel that you need to pick up every small bone drop. This method is also much lower effort if ignoring the bones and GP entirely, so keep that in mind. As for other drops, like arrows, they're only worth picking up if you haven't started the range grind yet. Similar to hill giants, minotaurs are a very movement-focused melee. This means that besides wearing lighter armor, you will need to keep your run energy in check to avoid running out. Some tips here are to keep an eye on the closest minotaur to you at all times, and avoid killing those on the far edges of the room. If you are forced to kill one far away from the others, try to walk it back before you kill it, to avoid having to run a farther distance. Also, this is a multi-combat area, so feel free to engage with multiple minotaurs at once to ensure that you're always in combat. I will try to keep this guide as friendly to all game clients as possible, but minotaurs pose enough of an efficiency challenge that I highly recommend Runelight. Using Runelight's ground items plugin, you can hide all useless drops like cooked meat and bronze full helms. You can also highlight important drops like skull halves, noted essence, and uncut gems. If you set it up right, you can spam left click on a loot pile to first pick up the important drops, then small bones or GP, and won't ever pick up any of the useless items. Also, I like to use the highlight NPC plugin since minnows can blend in with the floor and the walls here. Finally, you can hide the left click attack option for the rats that run around the room to not accidentally attack them. All of these plugins are not required, but make this method significantly easier. As for SP rates, you will see rates climb from around 20k an hour at lower levels up to a maximum of 40k an hour with peak efficiency. If you are consistent with burying all bones, prayer rates should be just about a tenth of your melee rates. When giving this method a go, I highly recommend starting off without burying bones and then work up to bone burying. Personally, I did several hours without burying any bones before I felt comfortable enough getting prayer SP here. As for runecrafting, Minotaurs will technically give an effective rate of somewhere between 4.5 and 5.5 SP per hour. This is because runecrafting with these supplies gives a very high rate, which we will look at later in this guide. Since the effective runecrafting rate is higher than other methods, this is technically the most efficient thing to do in free-to-play for training your melees, so keep that in mind. Next, let's look at maximizing your actual melee SP rates at Moss Giants. Moss Giants offer the fastest melee SP rates for all free-to-play Ironmen. This is because of their high hit points and relatively low defense. Even without strength potions, Moss Giants offer a significantly faster SP rate than the Hill Giants. The trade-off, however, is that you will receive less prayer SP than Hill Giants. There are three spots to kill Moss Giants in free-to-play split between the Varrock Sewers, Crandor, and the Wilderness. This clip was taken in the Varrock Sewers, which is the spot I prefer due to the close proximity to Briophytus Lair. If you are looking just to get melee at speed, 
I recommend the Varach Sewers just because there are so many giants packed together here. If you are looking to maximize your boss tilt count, however, then I highly recommend using the Wilderness Spot instead, due to the much higher Mossy T drop rate there. Just keep in mind that the Wilderness Spot is often visited by PKers. Since Moss Giants hit hard, I recommend using the best in slot defensive gear like the Rune Plate Skirt, Rune Chain Body, Rune Full Helm, Fancy Boots, a Cape, Green Dehyde Band Braces, and your best shield. For offensive gear, bring your Rune Scimitar and the Amulet of Strength. As with other monsters, bring a Chisel that can uncup gen drops. Finally, you will likely take plenty of damage here, so I recommend bringing food like kebabs that could send your trips. As for drops, pick up all Big Bones, Law Runes, Nature Runes, GP, Mossy Keys, and Uncut Gems. For a little bit of extra food, you can also pick up their Spinach Rolls, which heal 2 HP each. Since the Moss Giants have such high hit points, you will spend a decent amount of time meleeing each one. After quickly picking up their loot and burying their bones, you will likely get several uninterrupted hits in before they die. This means it is much easier to start prey flicking prayers like ultimate strength and incredible reflexes. Similar to hill giants, you can also include protect from melee in your quick prays due to their attack speed lining up with your hits. Combining good movement and prey flicking, you will see rates climb from 30k at the lowest all the way up to 60k per hour at the fastest. Since they have higher HP than hill giants, the prayer rates will only sit between 1 and 4k per hour at most. Keep in mind, Moss Giants are very tough, so I recommend having base 60 melees before killing them here. Since we're talking Moss Giants, let's take a look at the Moss Giant boss, Bryophyta. Just like with Hill Giants and Obor, the Moss Giant boss needs a key to access the boss layer for each kill. While Bryo can be killed with melee, it is much easier to kill her with ranged. For this reason, when killing Moss Giants in the Varrot Sewers, I will also bring a Maple Short Bow and some arrows. You will also need an axe for the growth planes, but keep in mind there is an axe within the boss layer. As for the actual boss fight, start by praying Protect from Magic and standing a few tiles away from Bryo. Occasionally, she will spawn her growth planes, which need to all be killed before Bryo herself can be damaged. After getting each growth lane down to 1 HP or less, use an axe on them to finish them off. Keep in mind, sometimes a growth lane will get stuck behind Bryo, so move around a little bit to make sure that they all come over to you. After two or three growthing waves at most, hopefully, Bryophyta should be killed. If you are planning to maximize Bryophyta kills per trip, you can bring some prayer gear like monk robes. Personally, I like to bring a monk robe bottom and a holy symbol to switch out from my rune plate stir and strength amulet. Since Bry will drop plenty of rune items, make sure to bring some fire runes to high alt them. Finally, the noted steel bars can be used for some quick smithing XP and the noted strength potions can be used for killing moss giants later. Before moving on, let's talk about the Bryophyta's essence. In a recent update, the Bryophyta essence became free to play. Since free to players don't have access to battle staffs, you will need to bring the Bryo essence and 50,000 GP to Zaf and Varak to get the Bryophyta staff. The Bryo staff has a 1 in 15 chance to save a nature rune each time you cast a spell, meaning the staff can be useful for long superheat smithing grinds. Keep in mind, the staff will only hold 1,000 nature runes at a time, so any more will need to be kept in your inventory. Personally, I don't think the time spent at Moss Giants and Bryophyta are worth the small boost to smithing XP, but there are several high-level UIM who will use the staff. I'll be skipping over flush drawlers since there really isn't too much to talk about with their AFK method. So for now, let's move on to meleeing Odorous Warriors. As mentioned earlier in this guide, Odorous Warriors can be found within dungeons at the Corsair Cove. They offer tons of Law Runes, Nature Runes, and GP, so they will be essential for getting the supplies needed to match efficiently. Odorouses have very high defense, so I recommend saving them for last on your journey to Matt's Melees. Most guides will recommend base 80 Melees, but I think base 90 Melees are preferred. If you killed Hill Giants or Moss Giants before this, you should be starting Odrises with 99 attack and 99 strength already. Odrises are unique as they have a 4 tick attack speed, the same speed as your own attacks. As a result, it is very easy to prey flick here. As you begin attacking one, 
you should get into a rhythm of receiving a hit one tick before your own attack. This results in two ticks of no flicking and then two ticks of flitting for the four tick cycle total. By prey flicking ultimate strength, incredible reflexes, and protect from melee from your quick preys, you can result with almost receiving no damage, but maximizing your own hits. As a result, some Iron Men will ignore armor entirely here and just bring offensive gear. Speaking of gear, I still recommend bringing the best in slot defensive gear to avoid taking damage when not flicking. This includes the rune plate skirt, rune chain body, rune full helm, fancy boots, green dehyde van braces, a cape, and your best shield. For offensive gear, bring the rune scimitar and the amulet of strength. Since Odrises drop limport roots, you should also be using strength potions here. As with all monsters, make sure to bring your chisel to cut any uncut gems. As mentioned earlier in this guide, you should pick up all big bones, law runes, nature runes, GP, uncut gems, fire runes, and rune items. Since you won't be needing constant GP for arrows anymore, feel free to skimp out on some of the high alts in favor of saving the nature runes for smithing instead. If you aren't a fan of constant prey flicking, there is a spot in the first Corsair Cove dungeon with a raw tuna spawn and a nearby fire for cooking. You will receive a lot of damage if you don't prey flick, so this spot is nice for not having to leave for food. Otherwise, you can lobster pot or harpoon fish in the Corsair Cove resource area for easy access to food that way. Before ending this melee segment, I want to quickly cover the topic of shields. If you heard me say best available shield before, that is because most high level shields need to be obtained from boss drops or by smithing them yourself. The first decent shield that you can get is the Mithril Kite Shield, which can easily be obtained from just killing Odrises or at 62 smithing. The Adamant Kite Shield will be your best smithable shield at this point, requiring only 82 smithing. The Rune Square Shield can be obtained as a drop from Bryophyta or at 93 smithing. The best in slot shield, the Rune Kite Shield, can be obtained as a drop from Obor or at 97 smithing. Keep in mind with these smithing requirements that you can plus one boost with a Dwarven Stout. The decision of which shield to use during melees will be up to your own preferences on how much effort you want to go through to obtain them. Personally, I think holding on to boss dropped shields is sort of annoying due to the training skills like smithing. When I started my melee grind, I just made an adamant tight shield, which was good enough, and used that until I unlocked the rune square shield later. By this point, you should have Matt's melees while simultaneously matched smithing and crafting. If starting from 89 smithing and 80 crafting, as discussed earlier, you would only need to telegraph and superheat up to around 97 smithing. Then you could have used all the remaining law runes to craft silver tiaras to finish both skills. If you are especially efficient, you could have finished 99 smithing and 99 crafting in the same silver inventory. If you have Matt's melees without finishing crafting and smithing, you will just need to train some post-combat XP until you do. By this point, you should only have a few skills left to train, those being the gatherer skills like workout fire mage, fishing cooking, and then prayer and rune crafting. Before jumping into the prey and rune crafting wall, let's go over fishing and cooking. Assuming you already have 20 fishing, we will be spending all of our fishing XP by catching trout and salmon through fly fishing. You will only need two things for basic fishing and cooking here, a fly fishing rod and feathers, both of which can be obtained from Garan's fishy business in Port Sarim. Assuming 58.4 fishing XP per feather, you can assume that 20 to 99 fishing will cost just around 230k GP in feathers. Technically speaking, this means that fishing and cooking can be finished as soon as you have saved up that much GP. There are two spots to fly fish in free to play. Barbarian Village, and East Lumbridge by the Goblins. Both spots offer roughly the same SP per hour, but each offers its own advantage. The Barbarian Village spot has a permanent left-click fire, acting as a range. The Lumbridge spot has more NPCs walking around, but less overall movement and a nearby oak tree for fires. More on that in a minute. For the following methods, we will bounce between the two. When getting into methods for fishing, there is a big jump in XP depending on whether you will be tick manipulating or not. Normal fly fishing is a 5 tick action, 
meaning they'll be rolling a chance to catch a salmon or a trout every five game ticks. On top of the five tick time to roll for each fish, you will also normally spend a lot of time at the fire cooking each fish. When tick manipulating, however, we will be looking to add more successful rolls per hour for each fish while minimizing the time spent cooking. The first method we'll be looking at is three tick fishing and two tick cooking, considered to be the easiest decent fishing method. This method takes advantage of two tick manipulations, eat fishing and single item cooking. When fly fishing, you can use the action of eating a fish to roll a chance at catching a fish every three game ticks as opposed to every five game ticks normally. Since we'll be cooking the fish anyway, this is a great way to use up your cooked food without dropping it. Additionally, you can also use a snow pile to three tick fish exactly like how you would three tick woodcut at willow trees. For this method, you can combine the two by eat fishing until you eat all the cooked fish and then snow fishing to fill up your inventory with raw fish. Once your inventory is filled with raw fish, you can take advantage of the Barbarian Village fire to two tick cook. Normally, when you attempt to cook food with multiple of that food in your inventory, you'll be given a little chat interface for which foods to cook and how many of those foods to cook. However, by using a range with a single food item and a single possible cooked food option, you will cook the item the next game tick. By dropping all of your food on the ground at step one, then picking them up one at a time and cooking them, you can cook a fish every two game ticks. By combining the three tick fishing and two tick cooking, you can expect rates of around 45k fishing XP an hour and 60k an hour cooking XP. Now let's get into fishing and cooking for those of us who are serious about getting XP. When three tick fishing by eat fishing, there is a small window of time where your character isn't doing anything. Luckily for us, that window of time is just long enough for us to two tick cook if we utilize a fire adjacent or below our character. This method of three tick fishing and zero time cooking is commonly referred to as eerie fishing, named after the free to play hardcore Iron Man, Eerie. It is the fastest SP method for all free to play Iron Men. Since this is one of the tougher methods for free to play Iron Men to learn, let's start with the most basic version. Start by arriving at the fishing spot with a full inventory of cooked fish, some logs, a tinderbox, and your fishing supplies. You will also need an axe to chop some of the nearby trees for more logs, and maybe even a snow globe to chop those trees faster. Light a log next to the fishing spot, and then begin eat fishing. On the same tick that you will roll a fishing chance, eat a second fish in your inventory, and immediately click the raw fish that you should have just caught. Then use that fish on the fire beneath you. Make sure you only have one raw fish in your inventory when you do this. On the next tick, click the fishing spot again. If you do this correctly, you are still within the three tick fishing action from eating the original fish, so you should roll another and keep the cycle going. Remember, you will never catch fish 100% of the time, even at 99 fishing. So as you fail fishing chances, you can eat the cooked fish in your inventory for normal 3-tick fishing, and begin eerie fishing again as you catch more fish. Keep in mind to do this, you will occasionally run out of food entirely, so you will need to fish and then cook a full inventory of food to keep going again. Since you will be failing to catch a fish every 3 game ticks, let's talk about getting back on cycle. Do you remember when we discussed leather mining earlier in this guide? Well, that same leather action can be used here to double roll the fishing spot and all but guarantee a fish every four game ticks instead of waiting for the normal five tick chance. This way, you should only have two spaces in your inventory for fish, one for a raw fish and one for a cooked fish. For this, you'll need to grab a needle, thread, and a leather piece. Since inventory space doesn't really matter here too much, grab two or three leather pieces in case you mess up. The rest of your inventory can just be filled with logs and your normal fishing supplies. For this method, you can start the cycle normally by eat fishing and continuing the three tick fish zero time cook cycle until you fail to catch a fish. In the event that you fail to catch a fish, you can eat the fish that you've just cooked to start the three tick fishing cycle and catch the next fish. This should leave you with a single raw fish in your inventory. On the same tick that you catch that fish, Use the needle on a piece of leather in your inventory with the spacebar held down to start crafting leather gloves. 
Then immediately use the raw fish in your inventory on the fire to cook it. Then continue eerie fishing normally. Since the leather almost guarantees a fish, if done successfully, you should be right back on cycle. This method of restarting the cycle also works well when moving through it to a different fishing spot. As a disclaimer, just listening to someone like me describe this method is not going to teach you effectively. To really learn this method, I recommend spending some time studying the eerie fishing footage and practicing yourself. Though this can take a while to master, you will be getting some of the best rates for all of free-to-play Iron Men. If you are coming from the high-level stealing community of pay-to-play, you will likely find this method to be the most enjoyable method available in this game mode. Speaking of rates, Eerie Fishing can net upwards of 70,000 fishing XP and 95,000 cooking XP per hour. Though keep in mind that fishing success scales with level, so at higher fishing levels, you can expect to see over 85k fishing XP and over 110,000 cooking XP per hour. Getting into the fastest fishing and cooking rates possible, let's take a look at reducing cycle failure and restarting. Whenever you fail to catch a fish during eerie fishing, you are forced to use 4-tick leather to get back on cycle. This is because that you are relying on eating that fish to keep fishing, so that leather action slows things down. With snow, however, we can ensure that even when you fail to catch a fish, you can always roll a fishing chance every 3 game ticks. This brings us to Snowfire Fishing, a method recently discovered by Automelogy. This method requires everything that is done during normal 3-tick fish to your time cooking, but also requires an additional click on the snow pile on the same tick that you roll the fishing chance. Essentially, you will now be clicking the snow, raw fish, and fire on the same tick, as opposed to just the fish and the fire. Since the snow pile only lasts for 21 ticks, you will also need to make sure that you spawn more snow as needed. Through this, you will now only need to use leather in between snow piles and when moving to different fishing spots. I won't act as an expert on this method because I'm not, so feel free to study Automology's footage here to learn this. Keep in mind, he uses the Barbarian Village spot since he uses an alt account to grab logs from the Edgeville Bank and light fires for him to allow his main to always be fishing. After mastering this method, rates can exceed 95k fishing XP an hour and 125k cooking XP per hour. Clearly the fastest XP method in all of free-to-play. While Runelight isn't necessary here, there are a few plugins which can make things easier. The Snow Timer plugin does exactly that. It times how much longer the snow pile has until depletion. When the snow pile has six or so ticks left, that indicates that it's time to spawn another pile. Since fishing spots and fires don't deplete at specific times, we can use plugins which track the maximum and minimum times for how long they'll stay up. This way we can at least know when a fishing spot or fire may be close to depleting to mentally prepare us to change. For the fire, we can just use the fire timer plugin. For the fishing spot, we will use the NPC idle timer since fishing spots are technically NPCs in this game. For the NPC idle timer, enable a custom timer set to 318 seconds with a low value of 168 seconds. Finally, we can use custom menu swaps to hide the walk here option, as well as entity hire to avoid using raw fish on other players. Since snowfire fishing is the most efficient way to train fishing, and since it partially relies on eat fishing, this technically makes it so that it is efficient to train cooking all the way alongside fishing, even after 99 or 200 mil. However, once you hit 99 cooking, you do have the option to switch to snow leather fishing. This method is just as simple as single snow wood cutting, and just uses leather to keep your character fishing in between spawning snow piles. This method is much simpler than eerie fishing or snow fire fishing, and can net the same fishing rates just without any cooking at speed. Since these efficient fishing methods require chopping and burning logs, I recommend saving 99 fire making and 99 wood cutting until after 99 fishing and cooking. I also recommend saving 99 fishing and cooking until after you have finished training melees, since you will be catching and cooking food for telegraph preparation and potentially food and odorses like raw tuna. So let's say at this point you've matched ranged, 
melees, smithing, crafting, mining and magic, woodcut fire mate, and cooking fishing. Congrats, you're just about 42% of the way to max. The remaining 58% of your time will be spent on the last two skills, prayer and rune crafting. These are the slowest two skills, so finishing these will really test your desire to match a free-to-play Ultimate Iron Man. It's also the reason why even though many Iron Men have matched every skill besides these two, there's only one free-to-play UIM that is actually matched as of the recording of this guide. This is the Prey Rune Crafting Wall, and it must be overcome to match. Let's start with Prayer. Assuming you buried a decent amount of bones from whichever melee option you chose, you'll likely be starting with somewhere between 70 and 85 Prayer. Within free-to-play, our only reasonably fast option is to bury big bones, so we will train this skill at the only big bone spawns available, at the Wilderness Boneyard. Since the boneyard is filled with skeletons, you will need to wait about 10 minutes upon arriving to Diadro. In the meantime, feel free to stand on a single big bone spawn and defend yourself from the skeletons. If you don't have a weapon on you, there is a convenient iron scimitar spawn on the south side of the boneyard. While there are six big bone spawns at the boneyard, we will focus on the two most northern spawns here, due to their proximity. The base method is pretty simple. Run or walk between the two big bones, world hop until you fill your inventory, bury and repeat. If you are consistent with using up run energy, you'll start off with just around 7k prayer XP an hour. This is already faster than the next best method of efficient hill giants, which matches at around 6.5k per hour. Since the path between these two big bones has a small bone in between, we can pick up that small bone spawn for some additional XP as long as it doesn't interrupt our big bone burying too much. If you are running, it can be annoying to stop for that small bone, so generally I will only pick it up while I am walking. Since Boneyard Prayer can be pretty simple, the goal here will be to implement as many micro-efficiencies as you are comfortable with. To start off, We'll look at berry walking and early hops. If you click a bone in your inventory and a spot in the overworld in the same game tech, you will bury the bone and continue moving your character. This has to be the same game tech, otherwise your character will pause to bury the bone before moving again. Berry walking, as it is called, can speed up boneyard because this way you won't ever fill up your inventory, meaning that you can keep moving and keep hopping. Early hopping is just as it sounds hopping early to avoid unnecessary time in the overworld. Within RuneScape, your character will generally be a little further along than what you see on your screen. And when it comes to picking up objects, this is no different. Notice the timing in this clip from Tanadino about how he will hop just before he moves on to the last big bone. This one is a little harder to describe, so I recommend him giving this a try and feeling out when you should be world hopping. Combining berry walking and early hopping, you can expect around 10 to 11,000 prayer XP per hour. Keep in mind with these single hopping methods, you can expect to go for about two hours before hitting the hop limit. However, don't forget that switching between the Java and the C++ clients can give you an extra hop limit, coming to about four hours in total. If you see how much world hopping we're doing, you already know that it's time to implement double hop. Just like normal Boneyard, you are looking to pick up and bury the two big bone spawns as fast as possible. Since this method requires hopping so frequently, double hopping can increase rates immensely by reducing the time spent waiting. This method works with manual hop and continuous double hop, though the timing is very tight for continuous, so I only recommend that if for those who are experienced. Manual double hop might be a bit slower, but you are far less likely to fail any hops. You can only do this method for about an hour before hitting hop limit, so I highly recommend utilizing both the Java and C++ clients to raise this time to two hours. With double hop and other micro efficiencies, it is theoretically possible to see rates as high as 18k prayer XP per hour. If you want to test double hop out, a good beginner method to try is single bone continuous hop. This method is the easiest way to learn the mechanics of continuous hopping, and to get some decent prayer XP while you do so. By standing on one of the big bone spawns around the boneyard, you can pick it up, bury it, and hop in just a few clicks on each client. Doing boneyard this way can give just about 12.5k prayer XP per hour, 
making it faster than even the most efficient single hop methods. As with the other double hop methods, however, this can only be done for about two hours, even with both client types, before hitting the hop limit. Boneyard is an interesting case, since you will need to structure your gains around hop limits. If you only play for an hour or two a day, this won't really affect you. But if you play eight or more hours a day, you will be throttled in your at speed games by these hop limits. Luckily, these methods do not require empty inventories, so you can hop between different skills while waiting for your hops to regenerate. Some methods to consider hopping to while training Boneyard include things like fish and cooking, workout fire making, or rune crafting. Personally, I do all my Boneyard prayer with rune crafting gear, and then train those two skills side by side. The general rule here is that hops will fully regenerate in about 4 hours, so you just need to find something to do during that time. Even if that break is just hitting a hop limit at night, going to bed, and then waking up the next morning with a fresh set of hops. With steel hopping, the obvious concern is the possibility of PKers finding you with gear that you don't want to lose. Personally, I've done about 200 hours of Boneyard so far, and I haven't encountered any serious PKers. Generally, they just don't really bother with the area, as they have other places to be, like the nature and spawn and the wilderness moss giants. But if you want to feel safe, you can always hide any expensive gear in your inventory to avoid unwanted attention. The goal with steel hopping this steel is that you don't want to get yourself into a position where this is the last steel on your journey to maxing, because otherwise you will be stuck with waiting for hops to regenerate or sticking with lower EHP methods. Ideally, you finish prayer before the other skills, like runecrafting. Speaking of, let's look at what will likely be your last skill. Runecrafting for free-to-play Iron Man is very simple. Mine essence, bring that essence to an altar, and craft runes. There are two types of runes worth making as an Iron Man, earth runes and body runes. While earth rune crafting can be done at any time, body rune crafting efficiently requires a combat route which involves killing minotaurs or flesh trawlers for their skull scepter teleport charges. Let's start with earth rune crafting. This method takes advantage of the relatively short distance between Aubrey's Essence Mine Teleport and the Earth Altar, located northeast of Arach, as well as the relatively close Chronicle Teleport to get back. Grab a Rune Pickaxe, your Chronicle, and an Earth Tiara. Earth Tiaras can be made by using an Earth Talisman and a Tiara on the Earth Altar. It allows you to have a wearable way to get into the Earth Altar. If you are wondering where to quickly get an Earth Talisman, I recommend killing men in Lumbridge, Varrock, or Edgeville. You will also need to complete Rune Mysteries to access the Essence Mine before doing this method. Start by using your Chronicle Teleport, run to Aubrey for an Essence Mine Teleport, Mine an inventory of rune essence, then run northeast to the earth altar. Craft the earth runes and repeat. You can expect around 4k rune crafting XP per hour doing this method. Since this method uses up lots of run energy, you can implement two different run restore methods. The first is to use your free minigame teleport every 20 minutes to Ferrat's Enclave, which you can do directly from the earth altar after crafting your runes. The second is to utilize the Chronicle Teleport's close proximity to the canoe spot and do a run restore trip up to Ferox and back. For Chronicle Canoe run restores, you will just need to bring an axe to chop the canoes. By adding in run restore laps every two rune crafting laps, plus utilizing the minigame teleport, you can expect rates up to 4.4k rune crafting XP per hour. Now let's look at implementing tick manipulation to mine the essence faster. The rune pickaxe has a 3 tick mining speed at the essence rock, which makes it seem the fastest. However, by manipulating using the 4 tick mining speed of the admin pickaxe, we can force double essence rolls every 4 game ticks. Since you mine essence with a 100% success rate, you will be getting 2 rune essence every roll coming out to two game essence every four game ticks. This is just referred to as two tick essence mining, and is faster than AFK three tick essence mining with the rune pickaxe. Upon entering the essence mine, there are two ways to start the two tick mining cycle, 
depending on whether you are standing adjacent to the essence rock or are at least one tile away. Since this method lines up nicely with your own character's movements, we can use visual indicators to know when to do each action. If you are not adjacent to the rock, start by clicking the essence rock and pathing over to it. Once you arrive, wait until your character raises their pickaxe above their head to the highest point. Before your character starts to swing the pickaxe back down, click the next tile over and then immediately click the essence rock again. If done successfully, you will receive two essence as soon as your character raises their pickaxe on the second tile. With the cycle started, you will now need to wait until your character's pickaxe comes up and then swings back down onto the essence rock before pathing to the next tile afterwards. This cycle requires movement, so you will need to move for each swing. Since we need to lead the essence mine through the portals anyway, you can slowly path to the tile closest to the portal to speed up trips. Keep in mind that you can continue the cycle around corners the same way you would normally, but you will need to have run energy active in order to do so. If you spawn into the mine directly adjacent to the rock, or mess up the cycle and need to restart, you can also start the cycle by clicking the essence rock, waiting one tick while your character turns to face the rock without starting the mining animation, then clicking the next tile over and immediately clicking the essence rock again. If done successfully, you will again receive two essence rocks while starting your mining on that second tile. By combining everything into Chronicle Canoe two tick essence earth runes, you can expect a maximum of around 4.7k runecrafting XP per hour. Since you will likely be putting all of your XP lamps from random events into runecrafting, Expect a more evened out rate of close to the 4.8k room crafting at speed per hour. If you killed Minotaurs or Flesh Trawlers for bone fragments to charge the Stroll Scepter, you should use those Scepter Teleports to train body room crafting, as it is the most efficient way to use the Stroll Scepter. If you haven't already, create the Stroll Scepter by combining the four Scepter pieces obtained from Minotaurs, Flesh Trawlers, Catabal Ponds, and Ankus on each level of the Stronghold of Security. While not required, I highly recommend bringing your finished scepter to Soul's Tune with fancier fighting boots equipped at the bottom level of the Stronghold of Security so that he can imbue the scepter. This makes it so that it will not break upon running out of charges. Additionally, you will also need a body tiara. Body talismans to make the tiara can be obtained from guards in Falador or Varak as well as hill giants. Finally, bring a chronicle, a rune or adamant pickaxe depending on if you want a two-tick essence mine or not, and an axe for run restore trips up to Ferrat's Enclave. This method is just like chronicle to new earth runes, except instead of running to the earth altar, you will be still scepter teleporting out of the essence mine to the barbarian village, then running northwest to the body altar. With this method, you can expect around 6.7k rune crafting at speed per hour with 2 tick essence mining, or around 6.3k at speed per hour with the rune pickaxe. For the Stroll Scepter, you will need to constantly recharge it with bone fragments from your inventory, since the Scepter itself will only allow for up to 10 charges in free to play. When filling the Stroll Scepter, the game will give you an interface to ask for how many charges you would like to add. If the scepter already has 9 charges though, you can skip this interface and have the one charge added automatically to fill the scepter. For this reason, I recommend adding a charge to the scepter after every single teleport to avoid these interface delays. Finally, if you killed minotaurs for melees, you should also have a stack of noted essence to use. The best way to efficiently use this noted essence is to do body runecrafting normally but utilize your run restore trips to unnote the essence at the Ferrot's Banker. Essentially, you will be skipping a mining trip every three laps by filling your inventory and then scepter tallying straight from Ferrot back to the body altar. By adding the noted essence every time you get to Ferrot's for run restores, you can expect the fastest sustainable rune crafting XP rates for free to play Ultimate Iron Man at just under 9k XP per hour. Accounting for the time to kill Minotaurs, the effective runecrafting rate is then just about 5.5k runecrafting XP per hour, 
which means it is much faster to kill minotaurs and to train runecrafting than it is to train earth runecrafting normally. For this reason, as mentioned earlier in this guide, minotaurs are the most efficient monster to kill. As a general point to make, there is a reason why I left prayer and runecrafting at the end of this guide. As the two slowest methods in all free to play, these methods are also the most susceptible to devaluing through updates. Let's say you spend 2,000 hours runecrafting at 4k SP per hour, and along comes an update which makes runecrafting 20k SP per hour. This would mean that you've wasted an incredible amount of time training this skill, and then all to have it go to waste. By saving the bulk of these slower skills until the end of your matching journey, you can potentially save thousands of hours and get lucky by having a big update come out in the near future. Of course, there's also a chance that these updates don't come. Unfortunately, we just have no way of knowing. On the flip side, saving these two very slow steals until the end will only make that final matching grind that much more sluggish. To avoid 3,000 straight hours of prayer and runecrafting at the end, it can be smart to train these skills whenever you find yourself with an empty inventory at different times. For example, when you finish superheating a large nature in stack after telegrabbing. This will be different for everyone, so see what works for you and your own goals. By this point, we should have covered everything for matching your free to play Ultimate Iron Man. Thanks for watching, and good luck on your own account. If you're watching this and thinking about creating a free-to-play Ultimate Iron Man, just go for it. It's fun.